I understand that you're involved in something, Thomas, called generative chemistry. I've never heard of that before. What does that mean? <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, it's this it's this great space actually before we're even hitting plants, right? It's understanding chemistry through large language models, but all, all types of artificial intelligence in, in most general terms, right? And if you want to stick close to language, probably a good one is retrosynthesis in, in that space, which you may not have heard of either, right? So, and I haven't because I'm not a chemist, right? But it's fascinating to, to learn. So this, essentially, this is decomposing chemistry, right? And understanding reactions required to produce a certain desired molecule, right? So once we know what molecule actually we, we want to create uh, to try the effect on, on a plant, right? We typically have scientists trying this based on all their historical knowledge and their brains and their smarts, right? Which is a bit of trial and error and very often succeeds, but needs a couple of runs, right? And what has been happening in the industry, it's not a Syngenta invention, uh, what we're doing together with many, many partners is to apply large language models to chemical reactions. Right? Because in the end, chemistry is a language. Right? And quite literally, actually, some of the models behind Google Translate have been used in chemistry. Right? Saying a reaction, oh, A plus B really? equals C, right, is kind of a language. Right? It's a very particular language. The, the fundamental model is reasonably similar. So what we're able to do with all this is essentially having the algorithm suggest chemical roots. That's how we call it. Right? Essentially suggest experiments, suggest reactions to do to create a desired molecule. Right? And the algorithm would generally get it right. right? Uh, where we're at at the moment is that we get a set of 10 probably recommendations. And we'll have our scientists look at these, sanity check those, and most likely they'll find one route that actually is very much uh, an appropriate one, right? That is able to create a molecule that's actually a very novel molecule. Hey, so this sounds somewhat familiar to me to the kinds of research uh, that DeepMind does with AlphaFold, where you're using uh, the, uh, the sequences of genetic information um, or protein information to predict what a protein structure will look like in 3D. And this has been historically a task that is extremely compute intensive, not very accurate, but just in recent years, these kinds of computational approaches have become suddenly extremely effective. And for some particular kinds of these, uh, at least protein structure, uh, prediction problems that AlphaFold is tackling, that DeepMind is tackling with AlphaFold, sorry. Um, they, these are like solved problems in some cases. Um, and in other cases, I know that it's still extremely difficult to be able to make these predictions accurately. So earlier this year, we had Professor Charlotte Dean from Oxford University in episode number 643, and she specialized in, uh, you know, she's friends with Demis Hesabis from DeepMind. And I think the night, if I remember correctly, the night before we recorded, she'd been having dinner with him. And so, you know, they end up talking about AlphaFold and these, uh, these, these uh, biological structure prediction problems. But Charlotte's tackling ones that um, DeepMind hasn't cracked yet. Uh, she has, because you know, there's, you know, some molecules um, have properties that make them easier to predict than others um, with today's technology. Yeah. So um, this sounds really fascinating. What kinds of compounds what kinds of compounds are you trying to predict thomas and why is this useful in agriculture so what's been most inspiring for me in the past month actually is when the models help scientists to stretch their own imagination right so when we're looking for for new products right new molecules that that can help protect plants they usually are generally known classes of activity Right. So when a scientist would see a molecule, they can usually say, like, this could be a viable option or not. Right. And what we're hoping to achieve, and we're seeing exciting first signs through these large language models and, and other models actually, is that we're we're stretching that, that universe that scientists look at. Right. And most recently, we again had a couple of recommended molecules 
uh, for a certain biological challenge. And in this set, there was one very, very odd molecule right, that our scientists just bluntly dismissed, saying like, this, this is never going to be a herbicide. It just doesn't look like a herbicide. This can't be a herbicide. Right? Then you still take a second look at it, and you realize that magically there is actually some activity like a herbicide. Right? It's not going to be oh, a product. Really? It wasn't a perfect suggestion, right? But it was something that every human would have completely dismissed. But for some magical reasons, it still is a black box, right? Our algorithms would say, look at this. So and that, that's for me the, the biggest promise, actually, right? That we can explore areas of chemistry that no man has ever looked before, essentially, because the model would suggest us to go there. And, and that, to me, is super exciting.